Welcome to Casual Friday. So a few things to talk about today. I want to uh, talk about my current work in progress that uses a technique that's new to me and has been really fun to learn. I want to talk about a couple of things on my shelves behind me that people have asked about, so I thought I'd show those to you. Then I want to talk about a couple of sweater projects that I'm thinking about right now and in the process of designing. After that, I'll talk a little bit about yarn substitutions. And then finally, at the end, I'll talk about some knitting patterns that I found in old newspapers from over 100 years ago. So let's get started. Oh, also, I want to remind you that if you want to jump around from, from topic to topic, there are direct links down in the description. This is something I'm currently working on. The pattern is called Talvel, and it's by Irina Anakiva, which I may be mispronouncing. But it uses a technique called, I was calling, I'm, I'm spelling it down here below, I was pronouncing it Rusitude, because I'm American and I was using American phonics. Uh, and then I saw a video where the people giving the instruction were calling it Roystude, and I thought that didn't seem right. So I went to Google Translate and asked it how to pronounce it. And Google Translate says, Roystude. So it means, I believe, rose inlay. It's an Estonian inlay technique, which means that you're not knitting this pattern. This pattern right here is not knitted into the mitt. It's laid, the, the, sec, the contrast color is laid across it. So I'm going to do an overhead and show you, I'm working on the second mitt right now, I'm going to show you how this technique is worked. So here's what I have in the pattern so far. And so you can see right here that the yarn is positioned over on the right edge of the pattern. Okay, so now I need to do the first stitch of inlay. So I'm going to bring the yarn forward and I have a double strand. I'm bringing it forward through here. I'm going to work the next stitch. And then I'm bringing the yarn to the back. Then I need to work two stitches plain. And you see how this yarn is laying right here? I'm going to be knitting so that the main yarn traps that yarn below. So do two stitches here. And now I need to bring the yarn forward again because I need to lay it across three stitches. So I bring it forward. I knit three more stitches. I bring it back to the back, across here. Then I'm going to knit two more stitches. And you can see how it's kind of loose here. I'm just going to, I'm not pulling it super tight, just snugging it a little bit, bringing it forward, knitting a stitch, and then bringing it back. And then I can work until it's time, around until it's time to work the next round of the motif. Okay, now I'm ready to, to do some more inlay, but the yarn is over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring it in front over the yarn here, but then I'm going to keep a big loop of yarn in the front and bring the working yarn and over to the back. So this time I need to work one stitch, and now I'm going to use this loop of yarn and bring it to the back, knit a plain stitch, bring the yarn forward again so that I can work the inlay for this stitch, bring it back again. Now I need to work two stitches. Bring it forward for one, bring it back again for two, and 
No, oh, that stitch hadn't gotten completed. Bring it forward for one. Back for one. And then forward for this last one. So now you see I have this big gigantic loop that's still sitting here but I can just pull, this is just basically woven through those stitches and I can just pull on this once I get that stitch back on the needle. I can just pull on this. I'm not gonna pull too tightly now. I can always adjust the tension on this. This one's a little loose right now. I, this is just woven in back and forth and I can adjust the tension on it whenever I want. So I first came across this technique when I was uh, taking a Latvian mitten class last spring. I, I did a number of videos um, of some discoveries that I made during the process of taking that class. The, the thing that I was really focused on when I was taking the Latvian mitten class was how the Latvians handled switching between uh, colors when they were using three, four, or more colors per round, because that is really common in Latvian knitting. So I was going through all of my books that had anything to do with stranded color work, and I was looking to see if they mentioned at all uh, the techniques that they used in order to do that. So one of the books that I looked through was this one by Nancy Bush called Folk Knitting in Estonia. And as I was flipping through it looking for uh, tips on multicolor stranded color work. I saw some stockings and maybe some glove patterns too, but I do remember there were stockings in there that had color motifs just down the side of the leg. And I thought, well, that's really unusual. You couldn't do that in stranded color work, really. And I looked and I noticed that it was this other technique, this rossitude technique. And I thought, well, that's, and I looked at the drawings and I thought, well, that's really interesting. That's something I'll have to put on my list of things that I'd like to learn. But at the time I was really focused on the, the Latvian mittens instead. So in this past week or so, I was thinking about something that I could knit that would be quick and easy for this party that we're going to on Christmas Eve where it's a little gift gift, not really exchange, but a game, a dice game where uh, people can win a, a present, open it, and, and the next person can steal that present or take something else. So I like to do a couple of little knitted items. A pair of fingerless mitts would be a really nice way to try out this technique and, and see what I thought of it. So I got really interested in it and I began looking for resources. Like were there any stitch dictionaries, for example, that included these these patterns so I could get a sense of what the limitations were of this technique. Because you're stranding, or not stranding, but you're laying the yarn across some number of stitches. And I wondered what the practical limit was for that and when you're adding multiple colors. I was just trying to get a sense of what the traditional patterns were like. And if I could look at those and see um, what the sort of boundaries and limitations were so then I could perhaps make my own designs that use this technique but in a way that works well. Because I think every technique is best suited for certain types of color work. So stranded color work is really suited for designs where you're alternating between colors every couple of stitches for the entire round. Uh, Intarsia is really well suited for blocks of color. There are techniques where you can do sort of a intarsia motif that's only in one part of a round using a technique called festive knitting or sort of a combination between stranded and intarsia. But it's really limited um, because it's, yeah, it's just that has some limitations. So this is a really interesting technique that I'm sure has limitations, but it also fills in some gaps that other color work doesn't meet. So I haven't found a stitch dictionary source, but I have found a few um, books that may lead to further information. Uh, and we'll see one of them is the first volume 
of a three volume set called Estonian Knitting. And volume, and it was originally written in Estonian, has been translated to English and is available in the United States. Volume two apparently has just been translated. And I was able to see a source in Europe that had the English language a version of volume two, which I believe has to do with socks and stockings. So should include some rosetude patterns in there, as well as in the first volume. And then the third volume is going to be, I believe, gloves and mittens and may not even have come out yet in Estonian. So certainly isn't available in English, but the textile center here in town has copy of, the, of volume one. So I am going to go to the textile center this weekend and see if I can find out more about um, this technique because I find it really interesting. Now, some of the other, I've got this upside down, some of the other techniques that are used in this pattern at the bottom, we've got some corrugated ribbing. So it's knit one, purl one ribbing, but where you alternate the color. And then there's a Latvian braid, which of course in this pattern just refers to it as a Baltic braid because this is an Estonian technique so they're calling it a Baltic braid but it's a it's a pretty simple pattern and it's a, it's been a lot of fun so far so I've been asked about a couple of things on my shelf one of them let's see which way one of them is this yellow thing right here somebody wanted to know is it a hat you know what is it and then somebody else noticed over here I have a book that says flak f l a k so I thought I'd tell you about both of these things. So my daughters were lucky uh, when they were in high school, they were able to take art classes. I think my oldest daughter took art all the way, she took ceramics all the way through AP ceramics her senior year. And she had her final year, eight, the AP ceramics had a theme that you had to have and you had to present this whole portfolio. So her theme was I think undersea life. And so one of the things that she uh, made in her ceramics class was this sort of a shell of uh, a creature that she then decorated. And that's what's up here. I just, I have things in my office on my shelves that were made by each member of my family. In some cases I have a couple of things and in other cases I've only maybe got one thing. Uh, some of the other things on that top shelf are, it's like a broken shell with a little uh, sea turtle that's come out of it. So it just sits up there coming out of its little shell. And then on this shelf right here, I have some bowls. I don't know who made this one. I can't tell. Uh, my husband made this one. Uh, we used to go to this thing, this place called Doing the Dishes, and it was a ceramics painting place, and we would go there sometimes. So I don't know if both of these were done by my husband or if one of these was done by uh, my younger daughter. I'm not, I'm not sure, but they hold um, like blocking pins and things like that in here. And then what do I have over here? Oh, the flak. So flak st stands for follow the leader Aaron knit along. And it was a knit along that was run by Janet Zabo back in it was the year I came back to knitting, so it must have been 2005. So it was like November 2005 to some, maybe June 2006. And I happened to be on these other Yahoo email groups where somebody was talking about it, mentioned that there was going to be this knit along started. And so I joined, I joined that Yahoo group right when it was getting formed. And what it was, was Janet Zabo did a lot of Erin uh, knit design. She, had, she wrote several books on Erin knitwear, including one that I have somewhere on my shelf. I had it on my shelf that's actually closer to my desk. So she was, she was finishing up writing this particular book at the time that the knit along came along. And that sweater was a transitional project for me in terms of it helped me move from relying strictly on a pattern and not requiring me to do a complete design myself. So Janet had selected the cables um, that were going to be in the sweater and which was, that is a skill in its 
in and of itself is selecting cables that go together. And so she had already done that part of it and she had done the gauge swatch. She had not knit a sweater using this pattern yet. She had designed many, many Erin sweaters before. And so this was, she was going to be knitting it along with us. And so she taught us how to do a gauge swatch for an Erin sweater, which was to do a fairly large swatch that included all of the cable panels that were going to be in the sweater. So you start with the center panel and then all of the ones that were coming over to the side and then a certain amount of the filler stitch that we wanted to use enough to actually do a, a gauge on the filler stitch. So what she told us to do was to use a needle smaller than we would normally use if we were knitting a stockinette sweater with that yarn. And that was the best tip. <laughs> that was absolutely the best tip. To knit at a firmer gauge when you're having a heavily cabled fabric means that the weight of the fabric is going to uh, not cause the, the sweater to stretch out. And I, so I've been wearing that sweater for 12, 13 years, something like that. And it is kept its shape perfectly and it does not pill. I've made a number of other cabled sweaters with the exact same brand of yarn or very similar ones using the needle that it's appropriate for the fabric and they tend to pill. So that was a really good tip. <laughs> and then she taught us how to measure ourselves, like how to measure, how to use a sweater that we have that's a similar yarn weight that fits us the way we like, how to, how to measure that, what to measure. And then we could figure out uh, what kind of neckline we wanted, whether we wanted a, a cardigan, a v-neck, whatever we wanted. And each step of the way, as we got to each component, was knit top down with saddles. We start with the saddles and then you start knitting the front and the back off of the saddles and you join in the round and it was a whole process. And it, I, learned, I learned an incredible amount from that. But it, it also gave us opportunities to make our own design choices in terms of the amount of ease we wanted, how we wanted to finish off the cuffs, if we want to extend some of the cables from the sleeve into the cuffs or some of the cables from the body into the bottom hem. And uh, it, it, was, it was a fantastic uh, learning opportunity. Now, this was all pre-Ravelry, and, and the other thing was, so then, so then about the time that the, the Knit Along wrapped up was when her book came out, and I had assumed that the book was going to be an exact, like they were going to be the same thing, like what we learned in the, in the Knit Along was going to be the same thing that was taught in the, in the book, and I would say in, they actually were very complementary. There was a lot of overlap in terms of concepts, but um, they, were, they were different things that were compatible and complementary to each other. So I'm really happy that I have both the book and the pattern. Now, at the time I did the knit along, she was releasing the PDF files every, at first it was like every week or so, they were coming very quickly at the beginning and then they were spaced out um, longer and longer. I think the last one came out a couple of months after the previous, um, after the one before that. But then when Ravelry came around, she compiled them all into one PDF and was selling it as um, Follow the Leader, Erin Knitalong. I don't know if it's still available on Ravelry. I think she has stopped doing design and therefore may not be supporting her patterns anymore and so therefore not selling them. I don't know. She really knew her stuff when it came to Erin. Um, sweater design and what I, I think she was a former engineer and one of the things that I appreciated about her was that she she's similar to me in that she's very technical a very technical knitter and not, didn't think of herself as a designer and that she found out that she could learn to design from practice and 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 trying things out over and over again and just that the experience compounds into making you be able to think in different ways than you ever would have been able to think before that. So I, I think of myself as more of an architectural designer, not a artistic designer. And I think that's kind of where she comes from as well. 
So what I have in here are all my original measurements and worksheets and the process that I, and the original PDFs that um, went with the flack. And I, I found it to be, a, you know, really worth <laughs> keeping in a three wing, a three ring binder. This is not something I would normally do. I tend to really lose track of, of, of things. I write them down, I throw them away. I don't, I don't pay any attention to them, but this is one thing that I've kept for more than 10 years. And, um, and I'm about to go and return to this in order to uh, design a sweater for myself this winter. So one of the things from knitting this fall is that I knit a sweater with a shawl collar and I've knit a few things with shawl collars that I haven't quite been happy with. And so I've done a lot of research, in different design books to try to figure out what it is that I want in a shawl collar that I'm, I haven't gotten so far. And to really learn some techniques to make the shawl collar exactly what I want. And I really had to look through a number of different design books and sort of consolidate all that information into something that works for me. So I, my original thought was that I was going to knit a shawl collar sweater using this, this very dark yarn. It's um, a yarn I bought myself for my birthday last year. It's from Ireland. And it's from Susanna Crampton. And she has a flock of Zwartbless sheep. So Zwartbless means black blaze. So they're black sheep and they have this white blaze and they have a white tip on their tail and little white um, stockings on their feet. And so she, ha she lives in a county in Ireland where they have a uh, spinning mule factory. So she has her wool spun into yarn and she also does things like she has blankets made from from her yarn as well that people can buy. People can go and tour her farm. She'll show them around. She's all over uh, Twitter with clips of her life as a sheep farmer, which I find very interesting. So I've been been planning on knitting something with this yarn and I thought I would knit a shawl collar sweater with it. But I pulled it out the other day and I and I put it on my neck and I thought this is not I have very sensitive skin on my neck and fold and uh, forehead and so I thought I do not want this right up against my neck so I'm going to have to knit something different with this yarn I have to I'll probably just knit a regular crew neck Aaron sweater from this using the information that I learned from from knitting the flax so many years ago. And then I'll have to find the right yarn in order to knit myself a sweater with a shawl collar that I really want. So I have these two different uh, things that I thought were gonna go together that I have to keep separate. So I thought, it might, I thought it might be interesting in the coming weeks to kind of show you my weekly progress on designing and, and how I go through that, how I swatch, how I, can sort of come up with an idea for what I want and how I uh, chart things out so that I can visualize what I'm going to see. So I'll be updating you with that um, in, you know, over the next few weeks and months as I, as I sort of figure out what it is I'm going to do. And um, also at some point I'll be figuring out going in the other direction where I like have a very specific sweater in mind and then I have to pick the yarn for it. Um, that's a more common process for me is to start with a project and then figure out the yarn. It's a little different for me to start with the yarn and then figure out the right project. It's not so hard in this case because it's it's a, a, a yarn I bought from Ireland and I like Aaron sweaters and that, that's fairly easy. The, the, the tricky part is figuring out the, what combination of cables I'm going to use but I'll keep you updated on, on both of those projects. So I often see on Ravelry somebody who's sort of new to knitting or new to sweater knitting, and they'll say, well, I really want to knit this pattern, and I have this yarn I really love, so I want to make that sweater with this yarn. Can I do that? Because they're not the same yarn weight, for example. And a lot of times they're dramatically different yarn weights, like instead of a, a fingering weight yarn, it's a, an Aran weight or something like that. And it isn't that it's impossible to figure this out mathematically, it's that it really often isn't a good idea just 
in terms of practicality. A fingering weight yarn will create a thin fabric with, with, um, with more drape than say an Aran weight yarn will. So this is a, a really common problem that knitters have is if they're not using the yarn called for in the pattern, they don't always know what an appropriate substitution is. So I thought I would tell you a little bit about how I have in the past have made these kinds of substitutions and probably will continue as I go forward, but how there's a, a tool, an online tool that you can use that is very helpful that I, it's been around for a few years, but I, I didn't know about it until recently. So when I am selecting a yarn for a project, like I've, I've selected a pattern that somebody else designed, I want to look at the yarn that they used to make the item. And I want to find something that is reasonably close to that yarn if I'm not using that yarn exactly. So I want to look at things like what is the fiber content? Is it machine washable or not? Is, and is that important to me for this project? I have to think about who is the person who's going to be wearing this thing or using this thing and do I need to think about that? Then I need to look at the yarn weight. Like is it a worsted weight? Is it a DK weight? And so, you know, because sometimes those are interchangeable. A DK weight yarn is thinner than a worsted weight yarn, but both of them are on a continuum. And so the ones, the DK weight yarns that are right at the edge of worsted weight and the worsted weight that's right at the edge of DK weight often are interchangeable. You can often substitute one for the other. But if they're at the opposite ends, if they're at the thinnest, uh, range of the DK or the thickest range of the worsted weight, you probably can't make that substitution without doing some math to accommodate for gauge differences and the difference in the drape of the fabric. Then you want to look at the structure of the yarn. So if it's a plied yarn, like a two, three, four ply yarn, and those often one can be substituted for the other. Um, but if the yarn is very different in structure, then you want to think a little bit more carefully. Uh, the chain at yarns and the blow yarns that have come out in the past number of years I've, that I've been experimenting with this year, with this year, and then I've talked about several times, tend to have twice as much yardage than applied yarn, which means they weigh less. They tend to be warm but they weigh less they, and so they don't have the same qualities that a yarn that is plied would have. So if a pattern calls for a chainette yarn or a blow yarn, it might be bulky weight and it might be something fairly uh, large in size, but it may not weigh very much. And if you were to substitute applied yarn for that chainette or blow yarn, the item is going to end up being a lot heavier and it may end up stretching more. So you want to think carefully about a substituting a yarn that's a very different structure um, than the one that was used in the pattern. Doesn't mean it won't work, it just means it's not going to be the same as the original item. And then finally, the thing, another thing you need to think about is the color. So I don't just mean one solid color for another, although that can be a consideration. If you use something that's very dark and it's a highly textured pattern, you're gonna have difficulty seeing what you're doing as you're knitting. And you're also going to have difficulty seeing the pattern when it's, when it's completed. So if you have something that's really intricate, you might wanna think about sticking to a medium to light, light color uh, yarn in order to work that project. And in addition, if it's something that's really intricately patterned or even maybe not so intricately patterned, but just patterned, you might wanna really think twice when you're using certain types of variegated yarns. So they're not all interchangeable. Some variegated yarns have very short repeats, like they repeat the colors, they switch between one another in very short lengths of time and others are very long. And the, the difference in when that happens and the size of the item that you're making can cause pooling or flashing. Then if you have self-striping yarn or that has a slow color change, sometimes those are just fine for textured items and sometimes they still detract from what it is you want to you, you want to be able to see, you really want to focus on the texture or the cables or whatever and you don't want the distraction of a color changing yarn. 
Sometimes it can work and sometimes it won't. So a number of years ago, I had this idea for a cabled sweater that I wanted to make and I thought I wanted some kind of purple. So I went to the yarn shop and I, I knew I wanted like a worsted weight or Aran weight yarn. I wasn't quite sure. It was something I was designing myself. And I looked at the purple yarns and I found one that I really liked. It was a dark purple and it had these kind of light colored uh, flecks in it. I really liked that yarn. And I found another yarn that was very similar to that in terms it was just as dark and it had these light colored flecks in it, but it, at a very different rate than the, than the first yarn had the, the light colored flecks. So I had a favorite of the two yarns and I swatched with the cable pattern using each of these yarns and I discovered the yarn that I actually, that I had preferred in the ball uh, was really disruptive to the cable pattern while the while the yarn that had fewer sort of tweedy flecks in it uh, looked great. So sometimes you know what you like in the ball is not going to be what you like in the fabric and it's worth experimenting. So these experiments that I do that teach me something about these two yarns comparing them side by side in the same in the same stitch patterns to see which ones work better is very informative but when you when you're trying to substitute one yarn for another, if you look closely and get, get a yarn that's as, as equivalent as you can to the one that's called for, then you'll have more confidence that the item's gonna turn out the way you expect. So this website, yarnsub.com, takes this concept that I've just sort of done on my own and takes it a step further because they compare things in ways that I wouldn't even think of but in ter they, they compare the exact yardage, they compare the exact fiber content, they compare the number of plies and the type of plies, because not all yarns that are plied are plied in the same way. So it isn't just applied yarn versus a chainette yarn or a blow yarn or a chenille yarn or a ribbon yarn. It's not just that, it's that even amongst the plied yarns, there's some real differences in what they do to fabric and how they impact the the warmth of the fabric and that sort of thing so this website really uh, really drills down into those similarities and differences and lays them all out they'll tell you exactly how they're alike how they're different and whether or not it's it's likely to be a good substitute, like an excellent substitute or a very good substitute or an okay substitute, that kind of thing. Now they don't have every single yarn that's currently being manufactured. They have a huge number of them and they probably don't have many that have been discontinued. If you don't, if you can't find the information you're looking for on yarnsub.com, then you can use some of these techniques that I, that I have been telling you about, about how to compare one yarn with another. This. I don't know what, what got me thinking about it, but I, I decided that I was going to look for knitting patterns in old newspapers in the past couple of days. And because I had this idea that they sometimes had printed those because, you know, obviously they print recipes and they household hints and things like that. And I thought, I bet you anything I could find some old knitting patterns in newspapers. And I did. I haven't quite figured out the best search terms to use yet. I was looking for just knitting patterns and th those don't always yield the results I want. But what I did find, starting in 1895, the Boston Globe had a regular section of the newspaper that was aimed at women and it was to, it was like housekeepers, hints or something like that and included things like recipes and uh, how to deal with flowers and needlework and included crochet and knitting patterns and these were all things that were user submitted and they were asking asking that you these should be a, a recipe that you have used many times and you know that it works and you have to be very explicit about the directions you can't be vague about it like a lot of cookbooks are and so that was true for the knitting patterns as well. So I, I was going through and I found um, a pattern for a lady's sweater and it was from 1906, I believe, and it has the entire pattern written out. And what I, what I think is interesting, I, I, I found a few of these sweater patterns, not just for this one, but there was like a girl's sweater pattern uh, in a couple of different issues. And oftentimes these sweaters were knit from the bottom up 
to the shoulders and you'd separate from the neck and then you just knit back down in the other way and then you'd seam up the sides and then they'd have you knit the sleeve separately and then sew it in. They never told you what direction that you were knitting the sleeve, which I thought was kind of interesting. It seems like from the patterns that I was reading that they always started at the top of the sleeve and were working their way down to the ribbed cuff. They never mentioned gauge. They do tell you how much yarn you need. They don't, they don't mention a yarn weight. I think there were only a few, few types of yarn, like a yarn, if you're gonna make a sweater, you'd have this kind of yarn. And they would tell you needle sizes and they would indicate sometimes bone needles versus stainless steel needles. And I'm not sure why that is. I, I need to find out more. I don't know if the bone needles were the heavier needle, like bigger needles and the stainless steel ones were the ones for, for working in finer gauges. I'm not, I just, I don't know. So I went through a couple of these patterns to see if I could visualize what was going on and I could for the most part. Uh, and then some, some of the patterns I found were just stitch patterns. And one in particular I found was called Smyrna Lace and it appeared in 1896 in the Boston Globe and it's only it's an 18 row repeat and the only thing that they say about it at the very end was that it would it would be very it would be pretty for pillowcases so i was imagining that you would be making like a like i was thinking like a decorative pillow like that that would be the pattern that you would use as the cover for a decorative pillow. And so I was charting it out and I'm like, this does not make, se <laughs> make sense for a pillow. And then I finally realized, oh, it's a decorative edging for a bed pillow case, like those lace decorative edgings. So, so I charted it out. I haven't knit it up yet, but I charted it out, and which I'll show you right here. And then I went and I looked online to see if I could find any other references to Smyrna lace. And I found one, and there's one on Ravelry. And that person used a pattern that appeared in a Canadian newspaper in 1891. And it looks very similar. It's not the same. That pattern looks like it's more to be used um, as a in panel insert rather than as an edging, because the one that I found definitely is an edging. Anyway, I thought it was interesting to go through these old newspapers and see the knitting patterns and, um, you know, there's no schematics, there's no finished measurements except for chest measurement. I found them easier, I found these patterns much easier to read than patterns from, say, the mid-19th century when the whole idea of knitting patterns was a new thing. I really did find these to be fairly clearly written, but I don't know... I, I, want, I do wonder how well they turned out for people when you didn't have information about gauge and really there's no schematic, there's no information about how big around anything else is going to be. And for the most part, no pictures. Like the drawing of the lady's sweater was unusual that uh, it actually showed you what the thing was going to look like because none of the other patterns that I've found so far have done that. So I do plan to knit up the, the Smyrna lace just to see what it looks like. And uh, then I wanna keep looking through some of these patterns to see if there's something smaller, like a hat or something that I could try to knit uh, from one of these newspaper patterns and, and see how that goes and see how I like the fit of it. So uh, I'll keep you posted on that. That should be fun. If you like my videos, you can show your appreciation by buying me a coffee on Kopi.com. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks, Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.